Ah, good afternoon. I'm Nat Wood, as some of you know, anyway. And this is 30 frames a second. It is my um, unbridled privilege to have three of the most dynamic uh, human rights activists in the, in the, well, in the last half century or so. Um, uh, as you know, we are pulling up close to the 50th anniversary of uh, the historic march on Washington. That will be uh, later on um, um, this month. Um, but what many people don't know or don't really appreciate is that we are also pulling into, I believe, the 40, 45th anniversary of uh, the Kerner Commission's report. Um, and uh, a year later, um, the establishment of the Kerner Commission, and a year later, the report that ensued that uh, I think it was like 242 pages and it became a bestseller. Um, it is uh, an historical um, piece of work. It's an historical subject, and it brings um, so many things to play that exist today that affects uh, community of colors, communities of color, especially the African American community. And I, again, it's my extraordinary privilege to have with me today um, uh, the uh, indefatigable, uh, indefatigable, indefatigable, inexhaustible Coley Clark. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the legendary uh, Ralph Pointer and uh, equally as legendary Betty Davis from the New Abolitionist Movement. Um, so we're going to get into that. We're going to uh, bring you some uh, facts and some figures and some statistics and who said what and who did what and how we got to this place and what we need to do to get out of this place. And uh, I'm going to uh, hopefully is pick up as much from uh, these three genius minds as, as you do. And we can uh, sort of build our own future as opposed to having it handed down to us, which never seems to work. Um, with that, if uh, Richie and uh, Stephanie back there in the control room uh, are ready, they can roll my opening. And uh, bye-bye. and the perpetrator is now the victim. Mm -hmm. And that just drives me um, crazy. All right, and we're back. And uh, as I said, my guest today, uh, from uh, my left, camera right, is uh, Ralph, Ralph Pointer. Right. Um, tell, us, uh, tell us who you are, because they don't know. You've been... Uh, well, I've been active uh, since I came to New York in 1962, basically in the education department because I was a teacher. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we were all told from wherever we came that when you came to New York, you came to the land of milk and honey. And the streets <laughs> were paved for gold. And we all believed it. <laughs> and when I got to New York, I had some of the belief myself that uh, it was better here. Uh, and I found it was the same here uh, as every place else. And it was time to go to work again uh, uh, in New York. And I started right in on the education issue because we all know that education is the key, not only to the minds, but to the pocketbooks of our community. Mm -hmm. And we refuse to bite that bullet. Or those of us who bit the bullet were undersold by our politicians. And I would remind people that the New York City education budget today is equal to the 21st or the 22nd largest budget in the whole world. This is how much money is there. And if we were to control that budget, we would control that budget and control that education system. We would control the minds of our children and we would have jobs equal to the white community. Our unemployment wouldn't be 47, 50 percent. Mm. Our unemployment would be around 12 percent. And what a change and a difference that would make. And I see we are still, our politicians have still given this budget away. 
And as I refer to the Kerner Report, I see that uh, they, they use the term ghetto. We never reached the stage of ghetto. We were always less than ghetto because ghetto defines a community that is controlled by that community. And we never controlled anything in a community. We don't have the stores. And now what little we did have is being removed. So it's, without taking up too much time, I refer to all of the conditions that were here before the Kerner Report are on steroids now. Mm. And the conditions are many times worse. Uh, we have the corruption of the courts. And you know, the courts never did uh, deal with the law when they said they had to end redlining. They never dealt with that. And now we see uh, they still haven't dealt with it and they've gotten worse. Uh, subprime loans, that criminal document that they put out. I think the number is 70 to 75 percent of blacks and Latinos who got it were eligible for the regular loans. And it just goes on and on and on. And I would give my sisters here a, a, a chance to come into that because to sum it up, what we have is lawlessness that led to the need for a Kerner report Not on the on steroids, they've gone crazy. The banks have gone totally crazy. I think it is 10 million foreclosures. 10. It's going to come up to 13 million, million. before it's over. And, and, and what does that mean? And the transfer of money out of the black community. Here I'm talking about we never controlled the money in the community. And since then, they've transferred it out. It's gotten worse on the foreclosures, the futures uh, of our people. Education, all of our children, except those who look like Shaq, et cetera, uh, that's well, Shaq O'Neal. Like so, who play, play like Shaq. Shaq. Play like Shaq. <laughs> okay. Who play like Shaq. Had to get a loan. Yeah, looking like Shaq ain't going to get, get it done. Yeah, anyway, you got my drift. <laughs> yeah. and, so, yeah. all, and so not only have they taken the money out of the community, they've taken the future money out of the community. And the other people, the children, had to borrow from their, on their parents' credit. And so now they put their parents in the hole. How much property is going to be lost? by those who can't pay the loans of their children or grandchildren. We're in deep trouble here. Well, HUD has made it plain. HUD said the problem is not housing. The problem is that 40% of the homeless are black. They have no housing. There you have it. And what, what did the government do when they discovered the corruption of HUD many years ago? Mm -hmm. They changed the name and continued the That's business. Right. Yeah. Same 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 story and so and and i guess as the program progresses i will talk about what i think is different you know we said you know many years ago i think the kernel report says we're going to see two societies a black society and and you know like a wealthy society they were moving towards right, right, moving, right, moving right, in right. that direction well, right. as if we were not already uh, there yeah. well we have you know on steroids we have as i think is a 99% we have a small society of wealthy people and the white middle no, class. Ninety-nine percent is somewhat optimistic. Yeah, it, it, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. When people yeah. say we are the ninety-nine percent, yeah, ninety-nine you know. point nine yeah. nine. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I got their drift. I understand. And so now they've included white people in this uh, in this pattern. So yeah. you have you know like uh, several societies, but one is rich and the rest are very poor. And you know what? Uh, Betty, Betty said yeah, let me, let me, let me, um, because you've said a bunch of stuff, oh, right? yeah. <laughs> and we're gonna like uh, go through some of that. But uh, uh, Betty Davis, Miss Davis, uh, tell us uh, how you uh, got into this. And uh, first of all, I want to say thank you so much, Brother Woods, for oh, having us here. Thank really you. Really do appreciate an opportunity to get into educating people and speak truth to power, because as Frederick Douglass said. Uh, where you have uh, education and slavery are incompatible. Right. All right. So it is our job, with any tool that we have, to educate, educate, educate. And that's how you really organize. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to backtrack a little bit and explain that the gentleman sitting to my right not only um, got into education, he was one of the first foremost freedom fighters for community control of education, as opposed to what the uh, history of the civil rights movement was was the integration 
mm -hmm. of education. Mm -hmm. And Stokely Clark Michael made it quite clear where that was an unacceptable paradigm because it implied there was something wrong with being black and being black together. And he also made it quite clear that when you have integration, you drain off the mental and economic resources of your community into the dominant white supremacist community. And the Kerner report is very clear. It makes it clear that basically what the rioters wanted was to take part in the American quote unquote dream. And that we would have to go through all kinds of um, programs, funding especially, a new tax structure especially, to create a level uh, where these people could move up into the white American society. And um, Stokely Carmichael, as he was called at that time, made it quite clear that not only was this unacceptable, it was insulting, and it fed right into the concept of white supremacy. There was something wrong with black people. They could not control their communities. They could not control their schools. They could not run their institutions. Right. And the reason I commend in the way I got into the movement was uh, Brother Ralph Winter and Lynn Stewart and a group called the Teachers Freedom Party. I became um, a teacher in the New York City school system because of this organization, which was a very progressive caucus within the UFT. Ralph and Lynn were the co-founders of the UFT, as quiet as it's kept. Ralph came to that history as the son of a union organizer in the coal mines of Pittsburgh. Mm. Now, being black and a coal miner's son was a horrendous legacy to have. He worked in the deep pits, and when he came to New York City, um, they couldn't draft him because he had no fingerprints. The coal mines had burnt off his fingerprints. Wow. So this is the history of the so person you're, you're looking at. you're literally the canary. Yeah. They <laughs> got away. <laughs> you got away. Yeah. Queen, yeah. The canary got Queen got Mother away. Moore. They don't have many of those. <laughs> Queen Mother Moore used to say of, of Ralph, I don't know how the system ever let you get as far as it did right. with the history that you had. He had a working class background, but he had... Uh, uh, a mind of someone who understood what oppression meant. And one of the things he did was uh, he helped put the first uh, African-American principal in the system. You know, that community of right, Harlem was organizing. Right, right, right. And uh, he, he, um, he helped put him in. Right. And later on, the Puerto Rican community came to him and says, well, what have you got against us? Right. And he helped put the Fuentes in as right. one of the first principals yes, and he later went on to become a superintendent so and his, you were a social worker I was and a, Lynn was a librarian yes and yeah. she gave me when she became an attorney for the people um, you know representing many of the people the BLA and the, the movement of the 60s one of them being co-counsel with Chuck Way La Mamba yeah. on the uh -huh. Asada case mm -hmm. okay yeah. as well as co-counsel with Kunzler on the Larry Davis case. I know these are cases people are well, familiar with. Well, Mumba better add that he's now mayor of the city of Jackson. Exactly. Yes. I just assumed Brother right. Woods knew <laughs> that. Well, no. I'm uh, talking uh, I do. I'm but talking but we, want no, everybody, <laughs> we want, we want <laughs> everybody to be privy to this information. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm going to ask you. might also add that he was with the Republic of New right, Africa. Right, That's right, how right. I get it. And, and right, so right. the point I'm trying so to make is. So assume I know nothing. During those days, we had a movement that educated us. Yes, and correct. If you yes. Had, that demanded if you that, read, you ed, that you um, educate yourself. Exactly. If you hadn't read Franz Fanon's, right, right. okay, The Wretched of the Earth, <laughs> if you had not read Paolo Freire, The mm. Pedagogy of the Oppressed, mm. even if you hadn't read Mao Zedong, The Red Book, the Red Book okay, yeah. You, you almost couldn't There's speak. There's a path soul because to get at, uh, yeah. guns. Right. <laughs> they, they, they gave references yeah. from these books when, mm. when I was involved with the movement. So I came but into the movement. But you're not Malcolm to Malcolm's book. So we used to say that they had Thank you, Ma Sister Cole, Mauer yeah. in one pocket and Malcolm in the other. That's right. Mm. Exactly. Mm. So when you talk about where the education came from, it was a real education. As, as, as Malcolm said, it was a homemade education. Mm -hmm. We didn't get it from the college shows. We got it from those who were doing it. I don't think you can get it, it from the college exactly. I, I don't. We, I think we got it from people who were doing it, and they said, well, what helped me when I was yeah. out here organizing yeah. and trying to be successful? So that's my history. My history is I followed the teachings of Queen Mother Moore and the organizations like the Teachers Freedom Party, um, and there was Youth Against War and Fascism. I mean, when we fought to take back our school in Harlem under the community control banner, um, there was a young lady from youth
um, uh, against war and fascism, she took the first blow from a cop. She stepped in front of a cop for me. Mm. Okay? And she was a skinny little thing. When the cop hit her, she went flying up in the air like a little bird. I mean, mm. this, is, this is what we, what, what was done in those days. We fought for our communities. We took back our communities. And I'm grateful to these people for that legacy. And the sister to my right, even though um, I know she can speak for herself, when we feel realized She's that, humble. You speak for that her. The, the, yeah, go right, the, go right the, here. Go right here. <laughs> the, Democratic, <laughs> the, the Democratic Party was just another name for the Republicans, or as Fannie Lou Hamer called them. What did she call them? Dixiecrats? No, she, she says it's oh. the, the loyalist black Democrats. Oh. The loyalist black Democrats. Wow. And they tried more than once to sell her out. Many of us uh, looked for an alternative. And at that point, Cynthia McKinney was running, and Colia Clark came to New York City to help organize this to support Cynthia McKinney's uh, bid for the presidency, and that's how I met Colia. Uh, she has a history with the students uh, SNCC. SNCC, Students Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. I always have trouble saying that word nonviolent. She's with me. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah, you got to be careful. I'm sort of you got to be careful. You got to be careful. It's all right. Yeah, That's why we're yeah, non yeah. if you don't confuse it with no violence. Yeah. yeah. You know, and yeah. Um, yeah. one of the things I've always admired about Collier is her background in history. I mean, she is an authority on the Jeffersonian concepts in this She's country. She's amazing. And her understanding of the Federalist Bank system. She's amazing. And what it really was. Right. So, I, um... You know, when you say call your clock, you're saying a lot. And she has always run uh, on an opposite track to the American mythology system, which is the concept of a two-party mm -hmm. system. And I've always appreciated that she does that because she wants to speak the things that the so-called two-party system never mm -hmm. speaks about. Mm -hmm. And I respect her for that. My own history is that I was a teacher for many years in a school right across the street from Harlem Hospital. And um, after that, I went on to work as a librarian in a high school uh, because of the legacy of Lynn Stewart mm -hmm. and having received so much direction and inspiration from her. I became assistant principal and a principal. But basically, I never left the, the, the feeling that we have to continue to fight for our schools. And one of the things, another thing the Colonel Report makes clear, they were really trying to, to mainstream the leadership that came out of the civil rights movement and control the leadership of people like Malcolm in the human rights movement. There are really two different struggles. There was a struggle to become a part of, and there was a struggle to totally change it. We're gonna, and, I want to get report, into that because, um, 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 and, and, and I, and I, and I want to reintroduce Coley Clark, but mm -hmm. anybody yes. who doesn't know who Coley Clark is by <laughs> now just has not been paying attention. Mm -hmm. Go, uh, Coley Clark is like Google in a pantsuit. Oh, come on. She is, uh, well, Coley, speak for yourself, but because I could, I, could, I could take up a couple of hours. Well, um, I'm Coley um, Clark, and I'm out of the historic civil rights movement, begun with Medgar Wiley Everson. Mm -hmm. And of all places, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Mm -mm. In Mississippi, Jackson is, uh, of course, where I grew up. Uh, the county that houses Jackson Hines is my home. Um, but, you know, I'm here because of my history. Mm -hmm. Because uh, it was the civil rights folk in the Deep South that kicked off a movement in this country. Um, beginning really right after the, the, the fall of Reconstruction, but we'll pick it up uh, in the 50s and 60s. And I'm a shaped by that movement of the 50s and 60s and my historic ancestry coming out of families uh, that um, when you go online and, you, and, and I want you to Google the Clinton, Mississippi riot. Or you can Google Colonel Dabney, little Colonel Dabney because I'm from Dry Grove. And here will be the last battle, the last battle in the fight of black folk newly out of slavery to maintain their independence, their right as citizens of the, of, of, of the government. It will be here that um, in 1875, in one of the bloodiest campaigns in the United States of America, 
where thousands, literally thousands <coughs> of blacks are killed. It will be here that we, because of, of the President of the United States called Grant, President Grant, uh, allowing the Union troops to join with the Southerners, that Reconstruction will end and my anger begins in 1875. So you know how old I am now. So when you began to talk about why we're here uh, and who I am, and I go back to Colonel and to these two terrific people, both of whom I know as revolutionaries, because revolutionaries mean, for me means people who are about change, radical change of one order to the next. Not people who are about trying to figure out how we clean up, <laughs> liven up, humanize, the forces of continuity, but rather it's about changing it, coming up with something new. And what impressed me about both of them was that they were over there in Brooklyn talking about community control of schools. Now, I grew up where we controlled the school, that is, we had the colored school. <laughs> and I love it because the colored school had all of the apparatus of the white school except money, buildings. <laughs> <laughs> Equipment, books, but well, we had school, school, school attendance, but they had no right to make decisions for us. The decisions were made by the white school superintendent. So I grew up in that system. But the whole idea of that any city that has more than 70% of its youth in schools, black and brown and yellow in New York, and you don't control your school troubles me because the majority controls. So therefore, if the majority of students are students of color, mm -hmm. then there should be no question about who controls the schools in the city of New York. Or any inner city. No, no, I want to tell you New York. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because New York is where this comes from. I was here when y'all were talking that stuff. I said, you're crazy. What are they talking <laughs> about over there? These, these people are crazy. Mm -hmm. Don't they know that if you own it, you own it. But that great struggle that great struggle, which was compromised and destroyed, must go on. Well put. Must be, must be revived and, and going. And the Connor Commission report deals with that. Mm -hmm. That if you looked at the report, about 74% mm -hmm. of black, African American, African Negro, whatever you want to call us, mm -hmm. were in, by, by, by 1969, in so called desegregated schools or integrated schools, whichever word you want to choose. But today, 77% of us in white schools. Well, what's a white school? I mean, excuse me, in the same color schools, really. Yeah. But what is that? And why have we been compromised to the point where we have to leave our communities to go to white schools rather than, we want the problem. Why not to send a white kid to our community to school? Well, that was, well, that was a solution that was spoken <laughs> about, but I, I like to hark back to zero. Well, let, me, let me get in, I, uh, because <laughs> I want to get a little specific because you guys said a whole lot of stuff, and I want to, like, uh, bring it into focus. Um, uh, Betty, you mentioned, uh, uh, um, at that time, Stokely Carmichael. Um, and one of the things that I was looking at was a thing that, uh, Cody sent me a lot of information that I was looking at, and it's just mind-blowing stuff. Um, and uh, uh, Kwame Ture, then Stokely Carmichael, uh, wrote about black power, and you mentioned black power. And I'm just going to read the beginning of what he said. Yes. Uh, the advocates of black power reject the old slogans and meaningless rhetoric of previous years in the civil rights struggle. Mm -hmm. The language of yesterday is indeed irrelevant. Progress, nonviolence, integration, fear of white backlash. Um, um, now, one of the things that um, is so relevant today remember he said this in 1967 is that no matter what we do we have to add a disclaimer to it because we are still have that fear of white backlash so when we have a demonstration the first thing they say we's nonviolent uh, uh, 
uh, we ain't talking about all policemen. Yes. You know, we ain't talking about all right, white folks. Right, right, right. It's yes. always this disclaimer, which yes. has nothing to do with the subject at hand. Right. So Stokely was saying this in 1967. Mm -hmm. uh, he went on to say that one of the tragedies of the struggle against racism is that up to this point, there has been no national organization which could speak to the growing militancy of young black people in the urban ghettos in the Black Belt South. There's only been a civil rights movement whose um, tone of voice was adapted to an audience of middle class whites. Um, it claimed to speak for the needs of a community, but it did not speak in the tone of that community. Excellent. None of its so-called leaders could go into a rioting community and be listened to. Um, in a sense, the blame must be shared along with the mass media by those leaders for what happened in Watts, Harlem, Chicago, Cleveland, and other places. Each time the black people in those cities saw Dr. Martin Luther King get slapped, they became angry. When they saw... Um, um, let's see. When they saw little black girls bombed to death in the church and civil rights workers ambushed and murdered, mm -hmm. uh, they were angrier. And when nothing happened, they were steaming mad. Mm -hmm. We had nothing to offer that they could see except to go out and be beaten again. We helped build their frustration. Mm -hmm. We only had the old language of love <laughs> and suffering. And in most places, that is, from the liberals and middle class, we got back the old language of patience and progress. Uh, such language, along with um, admonitions to remain nonviolent and fear the white backlash, convinced some that, um, that that course was the only course to follow. It misled some into believing that a black minority could bow its head and get whipped into a meaningful position of power. The very notion is absurd. Uh, he, he speaks fully, but let's just take that, that initial uh, observation by Kwame Ture, then Stokely Carmichael, and um, transpose it to today. The more things change, the more they don't change at all. Well, mm -hmm. I'd like to comment on that. I have seen a change in the black community. Um, I visit Lynn Stewart in Texas, mm -hmm. Fort Worth, Texas, once mm -hmm. a month. And I love the traditional gospel music. Mm -hmm. And we don't get much of that here. Right. And so Sunday morning when I get up early to I have to get up four or five o'clock to drive ten miles to visit Lynn because the prison system, as you know, cuts off. If it's not the first ten or the first twelve cars, you don't get into eleven thirty. It's outrageous right. what's happening in I don't call them prisons anymore. I call them the death camps. But non nonetheless, I listen to the religious programs Sunday morning. And for the last two months, programs that have been on the air, for I said one was 17 years, one was 20 years, both of those programs are led by black, or, or, or hosted by black ministers. They talk about arming themselves. And one minister had, he had, and I, I was in his amazement when he said, I want somebody to call in who knows about guns, how to get them, where to get them, and how to use them. And a caller came, called on and says, you know, I'm manager of a, a gun shop, etc. And in the comments of the people who were there, and they said, stand your ground. And they says, nothing is applied justly in America. Whatever law they have, it's not applied justly. And I heard women say over the radio, my name is something, and I'm getting a gun, and if a cop mistakes my uh, front porch for somebody else's it's me and him it's going to be him first and then we'll talk about it in the courts and i'm saying but is hey, that a pattern or it's, it's a pattern 2000 yeah. no it's not a it's 13. It's not it's, that it's is an anomaly that's, that's what you like <laughs> but it's, it's those churches that you uh, those those i want a hundred men see. here and a hundred men there yeah, 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 Hallelujah! Yeah, Give me a hundred yeah, men, yeah, and I'll yeah, take this out. Yeah. That's what I grew up with. Because yeah. well, the majority say, oh, of no, 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 no,
not even two years ago. And as I was saying to Betty, you don't know what spark will bring about action based oh, yeah, on all true. of these realities of housing, uh, miseducation, um, inept political leaders or traitors right. as political leaders. Right. And this Trayvon Martin incident. Right. And we get a right. hundred of right. them every day. Right. Why Trayvon? Right. I don't know, but it has grabbed the imagination of people. Right. And what has happened right. is I hear, and I says, on a spiritual religious program, uh, the minister called for guns and get a response. Two months this has mm -hmm. been going on. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, this is new. Mm -hmm. and, and we talked about leaders and, and, and setting the argument. What we have now is we have, you talked about the NACP, while well, we have a fight against the NACP, against yeah. these things. And we have Reverend Pinckney over in, in Benton Harbor, Michigan, who led this, the boycott against Whirlpool successfully. So successful that they had to change their name. Because their stock became equivalent to junk stock, and now it's KitchenAid. Well, that was all Whirlpool because they had to reorganize due to this boycott. Now Reverend Pinckney is calling for a boycott of Florida, everything Florida, where we have our false leaders. And I'll mention Al Sharpton wants to go back and let's march again. And doing the same old thing and expecting a different result is insanity. And I'm not worried about Al. I'm worried about the rest of us who follow along in this nonsense. Things are changing. Well, let, me, let me chime in for a minute because mm -hmm. um, uh, I kind of think that um, I understand where you're coming from, but when I read Stokely's, uh, 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 Kwame's um, report, you know, um, he actually said that, that the people could recognize BS better than the leaders could dish it out. That, that there was a disconnect when they came back to the community, that the people themselves were angry at the mm -hmm. strategies that the, that the so-called leaders were employing. So I don't think the, the people themselves have ever been mis, um, actually uh, been misled. I think that there are a lot of leaders, so-called leaders, who act in their own best interest, or maybe they, maybe they honestly believe that this is the, uh, the route to progress. But what Stokely was saying, or at least the way I perceive it to be, is that um, as long as we, that, 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 that begging someone else to, to uh, uh, lead you is not the way to power, that we have been so afraid of white backlash. And I'm not even, I'm not even talking about our capacity to love, because our capacity to love seems to know no bounds. Amen, um, brother. Um, <laughs> But, but that, that uh, this, this turn the other cheek, and I'm not actually talking about whether to uh, uh, take up arms or not take up arms. I'm more specifically uh, referring to we should control our own communities. Uh, we must control our own destinies, win, lose, or draw. If, if our destiny is just that uh, um, we ask the white man to take mercy on us, mm -hmm. then uh, we have no destiny, we have no power, and everything mm -hmm. he says is correct. At least that's what I got out of the report. You wanted to chime in, I'm I sorry. I wanted to pick up on this duality of strategies that you and I are both discussing. Mm -hmm. The civil rights concept versus the human rights. Mm -hmm. And Malcolm emphasizing always when he spoke, Malcolm X said, this is a human rights struggle. Mm -hmm. You ground yourself in a civil rights struggle, then the government is the arbiter and the government is control. But as the so-called Declaration of Independence makes quite clear, we have inalienable rights based on the fact that we were born human mm -hmm. and that whenever anybody violates these rights, especially a government, you have the right to overthrow that government. Mm -hmm. But the Kerner report talks about uh, there's a fallacy there and a contradiction that is never addressed from my point of view. They talk about violence cannot build a better society. Disruption and disorder nourish repression, not justice. They're trying to get the so-called rioters to mm -hmm. chill. And they're trying to say, right. we will not tolerate this because we will not have a society based on violence, ignoring the fact that the so-called alleged violence of the rioters is really an act of self-defense against centuries of white supremacist violence, the lynchings, the legal lynchings, and the police assassinations of anybody on the street. 
And I think this Trayvon Martin case for me is another Emmett Till situation. When I w was a child and I saw the picture of Emmett Till in his casket, that did it for me. There was no way I would have joined a nonviolent uh, organization in America after seeing Emmett Till. When I heard what happened to Trayvon and who shot him, one of the things a, a Green Party member used to say, Teresa El Alamin, uh, North Carolina, she wrote a letter to the press in the South saying, even in the days of the Cowboys, you could not shoot an unarmed man even if he was a bandit. Uh, that it was, was totally against the code. So here's an unarmed child, and a man just shoots him because he allegedly felt threatened by him. This is going back to barbarism. And to me, this is another in the till situation. And now you're forcing me back to the in the till days, and I'm not going there. So the Kerner report never acknowledged the constant terrorism of the South. And I give Maya Angelou in her book, um, well, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, mm -hmm. credit for showing the constant terror of white supremacy in the South that black people lived under. Well, we must remember that the South, and if I may say, the South won the war, the psychology of the Civil War, and that is the right to believe in the false premise of white supremacy. And that continued, and it continued with Grant and Lee at Appomattox, when there was a surrender, he, the white soldiers of the South, the Confederacy, instead of turning their rifles over, were able to take their rifles home with them. And it says, hey, w w you're not defeated. While well, they took that belief of white supremacy plus guns back to a South and controlled it ever since. And then I go back to Zora Neale Thurston when she said, hey, uh, we can build our own schools. Don't tell me I have to sit down beside somebody. And as I said in the 60s, well, if we create quality schools, I can see a time when we will be the only ones in this country with quality schools and white folks will be bringing their children to our schools because they won't have quality schools. And here we are. See, you know, um, um, let me um, say something. Yeah. I just want to clear up something. One, nonviolence is not the same as no violence. I understand perfectly. That's one. I want to be clear so the audience is clear yes. because nonviolence mm -hmm. is not a problem. If we had uh, if we really had nonviolence, uh, we would change things. But we don't have nonviolence. On behalf of both communities. Uh, it don't have to be both communities. Because violence has to be present for nonviolence to exist. I don't want to do a nonviolence discussion. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, I heard Teresa's statement, but there has never been a time in the history of the United States of America during the cowboy days or any days when you didn't have a license to kill black. Yes, yeah, exactly. true. That's we true. need to be that's real clear about true. that because that's if true. we are not clear about that, we won't understand what Kerner is getting at. Mm -hmm. He says, the only problem I have with Kerner, they say they're moving toward, two, we are moving toward two societies, one black, one white. Good point, Colia. There were always two societies, mm -hmm. one slave <laughs> and one white. Let me let me let me say this. Let me say this because um, we refer to the Kerner Commission, and in a lot of ways, that's what this is all about. Um, um, but uh, as you stated uh, so eloquently, the Kerner Commission came about because of unrest in urban black communities, specifically. Yeah. They 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 mentioned Newark and Detroit by name. Uh -huh. And it was starting to spread to the yeah. outlying communities. Yes. Yeah, New Brunswick, Cairo, right. Illinois, right. those small places. Right. Yeah. Yes. So, so their motivation was not uh, 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 bringing black people up as well as, um, as much as it was quelling uh, excellent, excellent. Uh, violence Amen. within yes. the black community. Yes. So, so, so its mission was not specifically to create uh, an equal playing field Thank you. where we could compete. Also, right. uh, uh, um, I believe the, 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 the report, the Kerner report that came out a year later was predominantly composed or authored by uh, John Lindsay of New York. Mm -hmm. um, um, mm. uh, and, and John Lindsay's viewpoint was that, and this is the viewpoint of a lot of, of, of people, uh, 
I want to punch Cornell West in the mouth sometime because he keeps referring to us as some sort of, you know, downtrodden. And I'm like, I ain't downtrodden, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you can knock me down, um, um, but you're not going to trot all over me. Um, but uh, um, the idea was just to put massive, um, massive numbers of black people on welfare. Um, you referred to the 40s and the 50s. Um, but one of one of the things that they had in the report was that the um, the second generation uh, college students of the black community came about uh, because of an entrepreneur class of blacks who were able to send their kids to That's college. Exactly. And in the and and in the forties, in the fifties, in mm -hmm, the sixties, mm -hmm. we got away from that Integration entrepreneur. Killed it. Correct. Mm -hmm. We got away from that entrepreneur yes. class and started integrating into the white society. Yes. And little by little, we lost that edge. So there was a lot of things in the Kerner report that points to the fact that we abrogated our authority to the white society and the white society uh, uh, came to the conclusion that came to the same conclusion as always had that we are an inferior people who cannot do for ourselves Child and like thus that. they must yeah. feed us Mm -hmm. and clothe us and give us and our then, idols and then cuss us out because mm -hmm. they look and well, they spend well, a whole lot of money. I think we have yes. to also talk about the Kerner report in that they had decided to the the answer was to give us a feeling of power right yeah, and and they have been extremely successful at it with uh, all of our so-called elected officials even the president has given us a feeling of power but with no power, with no change in economic situations, except that it has gotten worse. And I think after the, uh, the foreclosures and after this last economic um, downturn, they talked about the value of the average household of a family of four. And, and as my father has always said, and I remember hearing it as a child, as long as we remain the caboose of the train, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're in trouble. Mm -hmm. And now are we not only the caboose, they have put in a chain between the last right. car and the caboose. Right. We're further behind <laughs> economically and we have a sense, a feeling of power because with the election of Mr. Obama, I think the white papers is, was Glenn Greenwald made public through the New York Times that the FBI report had said uh, that uh, the only thing that can save the country from eight years of Bush is the election of Obama to quell uh, dissent at home and to give the foreign uh, elements uh, is that not the, the, the commission? There it is. Yes, the, the quelling. There, yeah. quelling. there, there it, it is. Nothing to they do have with, done with it. elevating. It's and, all and, about and quelling. And so th those of us who understood what they were talking about rebelled against it and we've been railing against it for 50 years and and here we are now we where are newark and detroit today hey the oh. non detroit's in bankruptcy detroit's in bankruptcy but i'd like to discuss yeah. that because that goes to the right. heart of the kernel commission um the people in detroit mm -hmm. and i'm specifically talking about the african-american mm -hmm. community mm -hmm. right due to the fact that these they came out of the 60s working in some of the best paid jobs Correct. in the factories Correct. in the, in the world. world. Correct. Okay. Highest paid Correct. black folk in, in the, the world. world. And Correct. now Detroit. they are disappeared. Right. They have left Detroit to the tune of what is it, seventy percent of them? Yeah. Right. Most okay. Right. And, <laughs> and those that were left are now working at thirteen to fourteen dollars an hour, down from twenty nine to thirty an hour. Right. It, right. But it also calls into question our capitalistic structure. And I give Stokely Carmichael credit because he talks about that. And toward the end, even Martin Luther King was saying there's something seriously Correct. wrong with capitalism. Correct. And one of the issues of capitalism is well. that the same bank managers that are now taking over as managers of Detroit are responsible for the home foreclosures because they did not give the same type of loans to the African-American yeah. community yeah. that a comparably economic European-American family would get. Yeah. Black people yeah. got 
subprime loans. Me, Why I people want, got want, equity loans? Right, I just want, I mean, I, I'm um, just going to say this loans. really quick because yeah. I want to make this point, and this is a personal opinion. Yes. Um, that that capitalism, um, um, communism, socialism. It's all basically irrelevant because the problem is not the system. The problem is it's the same damn devil's running the system. <laughs> and as long as it's the same damn yeah, devil's man, running brother. the system, ain't nothing going to happen good for you. Mm -hmm. So you can put mm -hmm. any system you want in. As, but long as, long as, you, white supremacy uh, right, as long as you got white supremacy and imperialism, it's not going to come. Uh, it's not gonna, that's but my the point own is, when opinion. you talk about Detroit, Detroit is a perfect example of how you co opt a movement. Because let's face it, that's what the Kerner said. If they're their exact language was, we must, re it will require unprecedented levels of funding. Right. And we're talking right. about uh, closing the gap between promise and performance. But they're talking about a specific class. Correct. Okay, and there's your analysis again that involves uh, some concept of, of what's wrong with capitalism. And then they go on to say, if necessary, new taxes will be enacted. Right. Now, if you look at what has happened all across America, and there's a group that calls FiscalTax.com. They analyze how, in the 90s, they started doing away with that tax structure that said, if you make more than $150,000 a year, you will pay a certain tax. Right. And if you make under that, you will pay a different tax. Right. That right. difference was no more <laughs> than maybe 5 to 10%. But right. it funded all of the new society. Right all of the what we call poverty print programs that got these false leadership in here that sold the rest of us out that was what they did they created a tax base that funded it so then it's very easy when you do away with that tax base to then get a negro such as you had out west campaigning against affirmative action no. because he made it on his own so let the rest of the black race Whatever make it on his own and now means. you're all set for the tea party blacks and all the rest of this insanity. Right, right. The point is, the Kerner Report set up not a solution, but a co-optation. Right, right, okay? right, right. Okay? And, and that failed. Right, and right. that failed. Yes. Right. Because we did didn't it? even fight yes, for yes, this. Yes, yes, let's, let's yeah. say, yeah. What, is, <laughs> what is the intent? Right. Yeah. Along, yeah. With, this, yeah. along mm -hmm. with this change of the tax structure came the Rockefeller laws. Right. Okay, which if you look at who they profiled as being responsible for the uprising in the 60s, the Rockefeller laws took care of that population and the wars in Vietnam and the Iraq war took, where, took care of the rest of them. Right. So between putting our youth on the front lines 40%, okay, and if you go to the Quaker website, they have a map of Brooklyn and who goes to war and who doesn't. With all due respect to all these movies they show, the white boys ain't going to the front lines. It's basically our black boys who went. Okay, so they right. killed off a whole generation right. there. Then they put the rest in jail, and jail changed. No longer could you get your GED. No longer could yes. you have the health, mm -hmm. decent mm -hmm. food. Really nice. Yes. Okay. Closed libraries. And all of these yeah. Yeah. All prison right. changes mm -hmm. were due to a brother like he, this. He, when he was in jail, and he did go to jail in the 60s for fighting for community control of schools, he brought about the first successful prison takeover in Rikers Island. 1969, 19, Rikers And there's Island. nothing written right, about it, right, okay? Right. And this but, was before right, Attica, right. all right? And they're not gonna, as Lynn says, they're not gonna ever allow that again mm -hmm. because they had a hint as to who I was and when I got to jail, I wondered, why am I segregated? You know, I didn't rob anybody's pocketbook. This was not about drugs. This was, and suddenly I can't associate with all of the other guys out there. They knew something that I hadn't thought of. Don't let this guy get with the inmates. Well, I got with the inmates and we shut the place down. We had the warden come in from a helicopter in Albany to talk about what was happening. And of course they take care of that now because they put our brothers and sisters three floors, five floors underground, totally segregated. I can't, you know, like have to have all kind of ingenious ways to talk to one another, not the whole organization. We I'm going to interrupt here because <clears throat> that, that speaks to what the final piece was in our coffin. All of the brothers and sisters who were responsible for the real struggle, which was an armed struggle in America, are in the bowels of the belly of the beast in prison. We've got over 70 political prisoners. Hundreds. 
600, some of whom have been in solitary confinement for 40 years. You're talking Russell Maroon Schultz, Matula Shakur, Sekou Odinga. These were the heart and H. soul Brown. of the movement. Uh, yeah. 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 And yeah. as he yeah. said, why won't they let them with the general population? Why won't they let them with some of these guys who are in there for nonviolent crimes, maybe you know, smoking a joint? who are only going to be there for two to three years. You let Russell Schultz talk Most to one of them for two minutes, of they'll change Most in jail are political prisoners. Yes. Um, Economic. Um, right. 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 But we're right. facing this March on Washington thing. Mm. Thank you, sister. And, and, and I think we, 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 when we got Kerner here because, first of all, Kerner, uh, the, 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 the Commission on Civil Disorders of Lyndon Johnson, 1967, was 67. Mm -hmm. I missed the height of the long black, the long hot summers of discontent. But they released the findings in '68, the year they take out the king, who has come to the point in his last work, a testament of hope, where he says that one, he embraces the violence, that I embrace the violence, that he understands. You know, you know, since Reconstruction. Our black men have been oppressed to the earth. I'm not using this exact word, but black men have been beaten down to the earth. So it's only natural that they should uprise. And this is a natural reaction. This is a human re reaction. And I'm sure that Fanon and the psychiatrists and our famous psychiatrists would also agree that this is a natural reaction. But he also goes on to say that it only takes a few dollars to desegregate some schools. It takes a few dollars to put some black politicians in office. Mm -hmm. But it, to reconstruct the African in America will be in the billions. And if it's not dealt with, the price in life lives will be very, very high. And we have gone through that because what we see happening is the release of that report and the passage at the same time of, uh, to show you how demon, demonic this stuff is, uh, in 60, you kill King and you pass a Native American Civil Rights Act. Most people don't know if we have a Native American Civil Rights Act passed and with the blood of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The natives reacted immediately and have been fighting for their rights as indigenous nations. But what we are seeing and we have to begin to talk about this March on Washington thing, uh, that it first of all does not have in place a real agenda. <laughs> you know, the labor has a side agenda where they are talking the old agenda of talking about you know, come here for jobs and justice. But the, the march, Trayvon Martin just happened to come down the road. So we grab that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, the Voting Rights Act, one of the hallmarks of the Civil Rights Movement, which has just been tough for all practical purposes, tossed out by the Supreme Court, uh, just happened to come down the road. Mm -hmm. They choose those two, they neglect to look at, at the same time, the same court that tossed out the Voting Rights Act also uh, has an affirmative action case mm -hmm. that says, I think it's Boston College, one of the college colleges mm -hmm. down at Boston, yes. that the colleges no longer have the right to talk about <laughs> no, that, balance, that is, the balance of the student it, population. It, it, yes. Come on, so blacks are cut out of college now. Yeah, yes. I went and I ain't through a rap. Okay. Go because ahead. it also <laughs> has, <laughs> I it also get into has, that. So wait a minute, right. it also has that same court, which the, the margins ain't picking this up now. They, mm -hmm. oh, the organizers on the march. They've been told yeah. not to no, pick no. it up. Uh, uh, well, you know, I mean, if you're a man, you ain't got to be too, you, a man right. is a man that's or true. he's not a man. That's true. That's true. He's either a man that's you're true. not a man. And mama, you got, my you, mama you, taught me that. You got she the said, wrong job if you're waiting on them to tell yeah, you what you can and cannot do. Yeah. Then maybe uh, so, <laughs> so neither <laughs> did they choose to pick up the fact that there was before the court a case, a union case, involving the right to sue your employer. Mm -hmm. I don't have the exact details that it was thrown out too. They can Google this. Oh, know. wait a minute. Yes. Now, why, uh, Harlem, are you listening? The uh, New York, are you listening? Yes. Also, before the coke was an immigration issue, mm -hmm. they yeah. tossed that out too. Yeah. Yes. So how I end up, and coming from a person out of the rights movement, how in the Dickens can you tell me mm -hmm. you were having a march, mm -hmm. and if you told me you were bringing two or three million to, up there to demonstrate for Lynn Stewart, to demonstrate for Mumia Jamal, to demonstrate for, 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 for all of these 13 million proposed uh, foreclosures, to demonstrate around the issues of the wars all over the world, if you told me you were coming after that, I'd even, I didn't go to the They're first march on Washington because it didn't make any sense. They're not going to 
but 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 we 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 have got to stop the abuse of Dr. King. Oh, yeah. and his legacy, the pimping of Dr. King. It's a that's, total that's the correct word. It's the America. Pimping. Everybody, yes, everybody it's, can be pimped. They it's, pimp it's, Malcolm. They pimp anything. Yes. anything. Yeah, yeah. Well, we got to stop they pimp it. Motherhood. Yes. They pimp fatherhood. We yes. stop it. We got to stop right. it. But then, how do we do that? Because we are not we anymore. Mm -hmm. Correct. That is what Connor did for us. Connor stripped us of we. Correct. Yes. I grew up in a black community with black schools and black this and black that and black businesses. Uh -oh. They were we, but I grew up with them. I grew up yes. with a sense of, of, of owning myself. Yeah. Well, what we, what we have here, due to uh, the, the propaganda, and I say the media, uh, uh, that we are faced now is one that no people in history have ever looked at. And we have this, and we have all of these little gimmicks, and we have everything, and that, that ignorant box, as Queen Mother Moore used to call it, in front of us. And the problem, on top of all of the problems that we have, is that we don't want to be us. There you go. And this, and when I was talking to the Puerto Rican independence movement, and uh, their success in getting their political prisoners out of jail, uh, one of the things that success, uh, was raised is the woman said, well, um, we are not politically sophisticated, but every Puerto Rican knows they're Puerto Rican. Amen. Except the Herman Badillo, who changed his name, you know. <laughs> That's back all right. He doesn't count anyway. Uh, 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 anyway. <laughs> Any, so, but they want to be Puerto Rican. But, and in the early 60s, Queen Mother said to me, your job, and she was speaking to me, is to organize the black middle class to support you know, like uh, the inner cities. And my answer to her was, well, the reason why they're middle class is they're running away from being black. And now you want me to come and tell them, hey, you're black. It doesn't work like that. And if we don't have a sense of self, and what little sense of self we had is gone. We have all of these uh, successful, all of these. Um, we have some successful black people who are working very hard to be white, and this is how we identify ourselves. Success is being white for most. But we're the only people. group. We're the only group in America that has decided that we are Americans. Americans. The Irish are still Irish. Yeah. The Polish are still Polish. Very English well. English is still English. Because we have been programmed when we got off the boat. Uh, Nicodemus, I believe, is, 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 is the way we can put it. Go back to our biblical mm. upbringing. Because those preachers in the churches were very clear. They were raising up a nation of black folk that would obey. And when we ceased to obey and decided that we were going to be Africans again, and that we were African, then we must go. We only got 30 seconds we here. Go. Um, um, well, Quickly wrap this up. Uh, wow, the main wow. Agendas, you're too much for me. One of the main agendas <laughs> of the Civil Rights Movement was... You can run up uh, the closing music... Uh, the so integration of the seconds. school system. From the first documents uh, that uh, you will find about Africans captive in America is that we fought for schools. The first public school in America is not far from where I grew up in the projects. Colored school number one. And... The integration We're gonna have to was end about there. that. We're gonna have to end now it we there. got charter schools. We'll be, we'll be back. We're going to finish this conversation. Peace. We're out.